Welcome to this wonderful week. And today we have um, a very, very special guest who's going to do two segments with us. And, uh, and that gentleman is, is Jack Carney. Now, Jack has set up a group called Widowers, and he is here to talk to us um, about that men's group, Widowers. Welcome to the show, Jack. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, now, Jack, your, your personal history, um, you've, had, uh, you've had a couple of tragic, uh, tragic circumstances with um, two life partners actually uh, dying on you, which is, which is very unfortunate. You've now set up a, a group called Widowers, which is uh, a men, men only, a men specific group, isn't it? Is that right? Very much so, yes. It's male only. And uh, the reason, because I've worked in the counseling area myself and uh, having experience, as you say, to uh, widowhoods, I really know that men respond to the dying of their partner very differently than women do. The research all shows that in my own experience verifies that as well. And uh, you've now set up this group because of those differences between men and women and their emotional reaction to um, a death of, of a life partner. Very definitely. I think what the research shows and, uh, is that men suffer from uh, premature mortality rates four to six times what uh, widows do. So widowers, uh, whether it be mental illness or death by accident or illness, uh, the research definitely shows that they suffer much more. And that's because that men don't have that uh, connected network that women generally do. Men generally have their permanent partner, their spouse. When uh, she is gone, uh, she mediates that emotional world for him. And when she's gone, he's bereft of that emotional support. And uh, men traditionally uh, have much uh, smaller ranges of coping with that grieving process than women do. You know, we've got sort of just that Mako version where you get tanked or whatever it is, or you just work yourself uh, silly so that you don't really pay attention to the absence. And uh, I think many men are just lost. Uh, certainly, um, I still feel that way myself uh, in fairly early through the grieving process. Also, I think there's an awful lot of bad uh, advice out there on what the grieving should be from people that do not have the actual experience themselves. Now, the, the group that you've just set up, uh, Widowers, there is a meeting coming up on, on April 6th. It's the first meeting, and we've got some information about that a little later on. You were saying, we were having a chat before, and we were perhaps talking about um, sometimes professional uh, professional. Uh, psychiatrists and, uh, and psychotherapists are perhaps the most appropriate means of, of support in, in a situation like that because it, as, much as, as much as you can learn a lot through, uh, through having your degree or, or whatever it is about death, there's nothing really, I guess in, in, in a sense, like experiencing it for yourself and, and sharing that grief uh, with others. Is, is that that's, that's the basis of widowers, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, it is a self-help group. Uh, while I'll be guiding it, there is no particular leader. Um, I think the thing is, is that every man in there shares that common experience, and he can be helped as well as help. And the research does show that the professional, the psychiatrist, the psychotherapist does not have um, as good a result as self-help groups do. So really, it's one of those experiences that you, no matter what you want to read about it, it's much different going through it. And only a person that has, I think, can really uh, give you his version of it. And it's not so much that you can give another person advice how to do it. I think when you've gone through it yourself, you wouldn't suppose to give anyone advice as how they should do it. All you can do is share your particular vision. And I think that's what I want this group to be able to do, is to open up the options available to men. They can see different role models, how other men have handled their grief and grieving process. And this bad advice out there that you should be done with it in three months or six months or one year, and then you'll be feeling better, but you've got to feel worse first, and you have to go through certain stages. It's popular in some academic uh, literature that there are various stages. And while that can be useful to a certain degree, there really aren't any um, set patterns. You can jump around in this whole process. You can be feeling great and think you've gone through it, and then the whole thing can cave in on you again. So, And it's not a matter of a year or two years. It's not an illness that you have to get over. It's uh, something that you have to live through, and it will remain with you for the rest of your life. It depends on how you learn to handle that relationship of actually living through the loss rather than trying to get over it, because you don't get over it. It's not an illness. So, so it's basically a time thing. 
Now we were talking also before about uh, about the ages of, of, of men in your group. Most of them are over 50, but this sort of grief uh, can happen at any age, and there is no age limit to widowers, is there? No, no, no. It can be as young as whatever the case may be in the 20s or even in the teens, I suppose, is possible. Um, and also, I think you want to um, get across that it's not so much to the length of time that has uh, transpired since the death of your spouse. Uh, that may be three weeks or it may be 10 years and you may still want to be a member of this. Uh, I don't think there's an end to the grieving process. It's just uh, used uh, better, more adaptively perhaps. And there are transition stages. But again, I think you want to be cautious about uh, listening to people saying, well, you shouldn't be doing this after a year. You really should be doing this. People that haven't experienced it will come up with that. And perhaps some academics that haven't really experienced it themselves may have certain models that they want to foist on the public. But uh, I, th I think caution is necessary. Now, we also, um, just for those viewers who, who weren't in the room with us before, we were, we were talking privately there. Um, there was and there is a distinction between divorce and, 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 uh, and having a partner actually die on you. Can you, can you explain to our viewers what that uh, distinction is? Yes, I, I think divorce is a real grieving process as well, and I'm not uh, by in any means trying to compare one to the other as what is worse. Uh, um, but uh, they are two different processes, and I think the feedback I've gotten from men and my own experience of having gone through a divorce as well as widowhood, that they are different and uh, they really need to be handled differently. Just as men, I think, need to just be with men in this particular process, I think it also has to be isolated from divorce because it is a different feeling altogether. Now, love is a, uh, a very delicate issue. We do have some information on the screen for you. Uh, Monday, April 6, is the first meeting um, uh, at your apartments, is that right? That's where it's going to be, yes. At, at uh, Jack, uh, Jack's, Jack Carney's apartments. The number there, which is on the screen, is 3220-1414. That number again, 3220-1414. And, uh, and if you're in that situation, it can be worked out and, uh, and worked out in a setting which is, uh, which is very supportive. Coming up next, we have uh, Jack to tell us about uh, a little bit about palliative care. But up now we have Dennis Knight and a song called Wild One. Here it is. Welcome back to Vision Today. It is Monday and uh, I hope you're having a wonderful day whatever you are doing and wherever you are. Today uh, we are going to talk about a very important issue and it's the issue of palliative care and it's very important to know that the death is, uh, is an, in, in, an, an in, Death is going to happen whether you are young, you are old, you can die, um, you, can, you can be struck down by lightning. Anything can happen at any one time. And um, here up uh, we have with us again uh, Jack, uh, Jack Carney to talk to us about palliative care. And uh, I guess, Jack, we were talking before um, about not necessarily curing um, someone who, who has a terminal illness but giving them a meaningful life or letting them have a meaningful life till the last breath. Yes, I think it's useful to just differentiate between uh, aggressive cure, as I would call it, and palliative care. And uh, when you cannot cure that person of the disease, uh, rather than uh, looking at the disease like most uh, scientific medicine does in an aggressive nature and with and a person attached to it, palliative care, when you can't really do anything about it, except control the symptoms, you're then addressing the person as a whole, meaning as a social unit. So they're involved as a family, the spouse, the children, what have you. So it's really a very, very 180 degree turn from looking at the disease to looking at the person as a whole. I guess um, the, the best way to describe it is, is, is a whole support unit because um, when, when death is, is on one's doorstep, like that in one's family, I, I guess. Um, I guess the support um, and the grieving process. Would you say the grieving process process actually starts from the person when they are um, diagnosed as terminally ill? Perhaps I think that could probably be said uh, would be correct. Uh, it, it is an ongoing transition to the death itself, and then beyond that. So palliative care doesn't stop with the death of the person, it continues through with the survivors, the caring for them afterwards and before. So it is that integral unit and you have to consider that continuity of life in the survivors, making a death good, making it beautiful, 
so that the survivors can continue and be uh, more socially integrated. And that's the essence, I think, of good palliative care. care. It's paying attention to the person as a social unit, not just a physical disease to be addressed. Now, palliative care um, costs a lot of money. Um, I think you mentioned a figure of around $75,000 to keep, to keep one nurse and one car on the road for a year um, through, say, a, an organisation like the Blue Nurses. Um, is there anything? Um, is there anything that the corporate world can can do? Do they have a responsibility here? I feel they definitely do, and I'm pleased that you could bring that up. Uh, that uh, I think uh, in America there seems to be much more of an involvement of the uh, commercial interest in the more charity-oriented uh, areas like palliative care. And I would like to, uh, if I can, uh, try to convince uh, corporations, uh, particularly Queensland-based ones, that can be involved in the community to show their they're caring for the community in that way because uh, palliative care is really underfunded. And my main theme with Cathro's uh, palliative care project is to educate people to understand the meaning and value of palliative care, which ends up trying to convince our politicians uh, that we need to put more funds into that because going out of life, I think, is just as important as coming into it. And uh, I think we have the responsibilities as a society to address those issues, and we need more money. Uh, it's, uh, I think, just uh, a terrible thing that if you have experienced a dying uh, person who you are closely connected with and you don't have that response that, say, Mount Olivet Home Care and the Blue Nursing Home Care units can give because of uh, lack of funding for nurses to come to you, then you will see how crucial it is. So I like to get people thinking that even though they haven't experienced it, open their hearts up and see how uh, much funding is needed for that. Now, um, just just to explain to those who, who are watching the show today, the Catharos uh, Palliative Care Project, where, where did the, uh, the name Catharos come from? That's a Greek name uh, which we derive our name Catherine from, which was the name of my wife, and uh, it means clear, pure, fit for service. It's, uh, I think, a beautiful name. Uh, our word cathartic comes from that as well as Catherine, so there's a purity element in that whole aspect. And, uh, I think her dying in life is exemplary in that sense, and I've named it after her in her honor. And so perhaps that uh, the death being such, um, it is such a taboo subject, isn't it? And it's something that perhaps uh, we're, we're very scared of. But, um, but when, when you see it from, from this perspective, knowing that, okay, um, it is inevitable that we're going to pass on to, uh, to perhaps another life, um, I, I, guess, I guess what you were also talking about before is that good palliative care um, erases the need uh, in, in most options for, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the option of euthanasia. Absolutely. I think the palliative care community in general uh, feels, as I do, that um, it oftentimes euthanasia is a red herring. It's only a result when you don't have good quality palliative care. When you have it, that is really an issue for, I think, a very, very small minority of people. And really, I think what uh, our community has to address is that once we can get the funding into palliative care, euthanasia will become what it really should be, which is really almost a non-issue. Uh, we've got to give the money where it needs to be addressed. And most dying, the scientific armamentarium for handling anxiety and pain is terrific out there. It's quite possible to handle it right straight through and allow the person to blossom even in the face of dying. And once you get the social connections right uh, and the family support is there, which isn't always there, uh, then I think dying at home is the is the preferred option. All the research shows that probably 60% of people uh, would rather have their people die at home, uh, but uh, for perhaps lack of uh, care and coverage, they, or perhaps family strength, they, they can't do it. Uh, but certainly it's preferable if you can't handle it to have it at home. And we need more funding for home care nursing to enable us to do that. Now, there, there are still 30 to 40 people um, on a waiting list um, for Mount Olivet uh, home care teams, is that right? Well, from time to time it varies. I don't know specifically what the number might be at this time, but certainly it's gotten up high like that. And I think, uh, in, in the same thing with the Blue Nurses, uh, I know both of these organizations uh, fairly intimately, and uh, I think it is uh, just, it's, an, it's a necessity for us as a community to understand that they are underfunded and our corporations and our politicians have to put more money to this because if they were suffering it themselves, they would want it, I can tell you that. Absolutely. Now you can do your part and, uh, and donate to the Palliative Care Association. The number's on your screen, 3258-2281. That's 3258-2281. Uh, 
No, different number, 32201414. Um, the other number there is also 32582281. And, uh, and perhaps you can, you can donate money. Can you also donate your time, Jack? Uh, absolutely. The, uh, the Mount Olivets, the Blue Nursing, have volunteer programs that they would love to uh, see you at. Uh, you can learn to be a carer. There's training involved. Uh, it's an extremely rewarding, uh, caring volunteer association that I'm sure people will get so much out of. It's, uh, it's a very important issue, as, as, um, as I've been stressing, and uh, it's something that, uh, that should be looked at uh, in, the, in the most serious sense. But, uh, but on, a, uh, on a different note, up next we have, uh, we have Dennis Knight yet again with another song and it's called I Thank You. So see you after the break. This kind of Thursday. Welcome back. Yesterday on Vision Today we were talking to Jack Carney about palliative care and an organisation called Widowers. Well Jack's got his finger in another pie. That pie is something called Mentors. Many of us define success in terms of monetary success or even jobs, our status of our job. Well, Mentors has a different way of defining success. Jack, would you like to elaborate on, on what your definition of success would be? Thank you for having me again. I think mentors is wanting to approach um, the idea of what a meaningful life is, what is maturity, and uh, one of the ways that I try to get us to think about that is what Plato said that there are two types of education. One is to learn the technical aspects of how to build the house and that is what careers are about. That's what second or your first adulthood is about, family, career, what have you. The second adulthood that mentors is concerned with is the meaning of life. What Plato would say, how to live in the house, not how to build it. So mentors is about that mind, the mature mind, what that is, the exploration and the encouragement of it in the community itself. What motivated you to form mentors? I, I have always wanted a group of people that were interested in the, in the ideas. I consider myself a philosopher, among other things, and uh, the meaning of truth, which is the etymological meaning of philosopher, has always been important to me. And I think to get that into the community, to have a sense of the importance of thinking about maturity, what does it mean to care for others, to share your life with them, all of those aspects have been of importance to me, especially in the latter part of my life. So what sort, of what sort of organization is Mentor and what do they do? Well, it, it's, a, it, it's nascent. We're very, we're very new. We don't have a lot there. We're trying to, I think, get out into the community, hence the, the program here. But really what we're talking about is discussing concepts. Uh, not, I call it saging rather than aging, although chronological uh, age is not uh, the, uh, the way that we would necessarily define you as being a member because you can be 80 and have repeated the first 20 years of your life four times uh, and not have learned much. But um, generally speaking, mentors are about 35 where there's some maturity of experience. And I guess the idea there is, is to share the meaning of your life with other people, uh, what maturity means. We discuss that in a group. And it's just uh, concepts that are of enriching and of communal value, not just isolated self-worth. But I think the self-worth only comes from other individuals being involved with you. That's right. Now, there was one point of issue that I wanted to discuss with you when I was reading the material, and that was um, that you mentioned this maturity being um, getting away from, from childhood or developing an adult maturity. Did you want to disqualify what mm. you meant there? Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be confused, as we were talking about, with um, not allowing that childhood or childness to develop in you. I think that's as a, a very definite part of maturity. What I'm talking about is childishness and where we do have to grow through adolescence. And the model I use is dependency of childhood, independency of adolescence, where unfortunately much of us stop in the Western culture, whether we're 20 or 80. And what I would suggest, maturity is moving through adolescence into true maturity, which is interdependence, where you know your wealth and your success comes from how you interact with other people and bring out the best in them as allowing them to bring out the best in you. Wonderful. It sounds very positive. Mm, hopefully it is. I, there are a lot of ideas flowing that way. Where do you see mentors going in the future? I would really like us to um, gather in more individuals of... I just think out in the community at, at large, there are a tremendous, a tremendous amount of wisdom I see 